Isabel, wiggle up. We'll have you next, Dad, please. <laughs> Where's your brother gone? <sighs> Go on, give him a shove. Come on, we need more room for the girls. <laughs> <laughs> the whole family in one bed. This is called pigging, and it's quite a common sight in 17th century England. Most people slept all together like this. I'm not sure we're going to get a good night's sleep, but it's certainly nice and warm, isn't it? It is. It is. Good night, everybody. <laughs> I'm Dr Lucy Worsley, Chief Curator at Historic Royal Palaces, based here at Hampton Court. Another day at the office. As a historian, though, I'm fascinated by the intimate, personal bits of history and the way they've shaped modern life. Oh, it's exciting, it's exciting! In this series, I'll be tracing the story of British domestic life through four rooms. The bedroom, the living room, the bathroom, and the kitchen. <laughs> From the homes of the Middle Ages to the present day, I'll be exploring the ways that our attitudes and habits have changed, meeting some extraordinary people <laughs> and doing some rather odd things. <laughs> this time, the bedroom. From the medieval communal hall to the glamorous boudoir. Full English for you this morning. I'll be seeing how its development has affected our most private moments. You're so like the person in the horror film who says that and then everything <laughs> yes. goes horribly yeah. wrong. <laughs> our houses are a reflection of ourselves. They tell us so much about how we live and who we are. But the homes we live in now have evolved over centuries. Every single room in a house like this one has got its own very interesting story. This time, the room that's been through some fascinating changes. It's always been used for sleeping, but it hasn't always been the safe haven that most of us take for granted. People's bedrooms today are really private places. You don't go in without an invitation. But in the past, bedrooms were surprisingly noisy, busy, social places. This idea that they're quiet places for sleeping is a relatively modern invention. Things were very different from this back in medieval homes. The very concept of a bedroom didn't exist for most people in medieval England. If you belonged to the household of the local lord and landowner, the Great Hall would have been your living and sleeping space. Just the most complete and impressive, it's isn't it? It's the greatest surviving hall that we've got from the 14th century. And isn't it wonderful? Look at this. They've got the central hearth, which hasn't um, ever been uh, replaced by a fireplace in the wall. And this is exactly what it would have been like. And it would have been full of people, of course. It would have been uh, the centre of the estate. People would have been coming and going all the time. The Great Hall was a powerful Saxon notion. It was expected to bind the community together and build a strong sense of shared values. People were entirely dependent on the lord of the manor, in this case the Pulteneys, uh, for their existence. You know, they didn't really get paid for much. It wasn't that sort of world. What they got was their keep. Household members were only indoors during the hours of darkness. They slept and ate in the hall. The safety found in numbers was more important than privacy. I think it's a very different concept from what we can imagine. But of course, in the Middle Ages, people were used to doing many more things communally, to sleeping communally. Mm -hmm. People didn't even have beds much. Uh, they certainly didn't have um, very developed bedrooms. Privacy, as we understand it, didn't exist. The floor of the Great Hall would have been covered in rushes which made things more comfortable and soaked up any spillages. But what you could do is just clean them all up, throw them all away and put down a fresh lot. Yes, you could. And you it's could, like sort of disposable carpet. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's perfectly true. Well, this is making things look a little bit more comfortable, yeah. no, I like isn't this it? look. The term to make the bed came from exactly that. You took a sack and filled it with hay. The sack was called a tick and was woven from hemp. In fact, the striped cotton cover you still get on mattresses today is called ticking. Nice and warm. So when night fell, they'd have locked the doors, battened down the hatches to keep out 
the robbers and the scary medieval darkness, and they would have gathered around the fire, got their sacks of hay, ready to hit the hay, notice, origin of expression, and then they had to cover the fire, and this leads to the expression curfew, doesn't it? Yes, from, it's from couvre-feu, cover fire in the French, and people put a container over the fire to keep the ashes warm so that uh, people weren't going to get burnt, the brushes weren't going to catch fire, but uh, the warmth would still be generated. And the sack is one part of the bed. We've got something missing, though. We hear from the Elizabethan traveller, William Harrison, that the people in medieval England weren't soft and wussy like the Tudors. They didn't have pillows. They slept with their head on a good hard log. Yes. The first proper bedroom was the chamber, a separate room above the great hall for the master and mistress of the household. It was a mark of high status to have a private room, and they used it for lots of different things. This room is set up as a dining room today, as later generations used it. But the medieval family used this room, which is up above the Great Hall, as a private solar, also known as a chamber, also known as a bower. These are all medieval words for something that we would recognise as a bed-sitting room. They had their bed in here, but they also used it for socialising, for parties with their friends. There's an element of the home office about it as well. They might have written letters in here, for example. So this is a very, very flexible space for the lord and lady, a very high-status version of the bedroom. This separate room was still a shared space for the lord, lady, their family and intimate servants. Their idea of privacy was very different from ours. It was the ability to be able to choose the people with whom you shared the room. This is a really clever little touch. It's a sneaky squint window so the Lord and Lady can check what's going on in the Great Hall down there. And they are literally looking down on the plebs who are so far below us there. You get a real sense of them and us up here. And it is literally us up here in the solar because this is an exclusive space, but it's for the Lord, the Lady, their closest relatives, also their most important servants, all sort of breathing the same air. This is privacy in the medieval sense. It's up and above the masses, but nobody expects to be all by themselves. That would be a bit weird. Beds were hugely expensive, so most people stayed sleeping on the sacks. Bed hangings were costly. Many dyes were expensive and weaving was labour intensive. You needed skilled craftsmen to carve and construct a wooden bed frame, which meant that only the rich could afford to commission a bed. They were such status symbols that aristocrats would take them with them when they travelled. But society was shifting. By the 16th century, a new and prosperous middle class, known as the middling sort, had emerged. Even middling houses like this one were now being built with an upper floor, and more ordinary families could afford to have a bedroom as well as a bed. Bedrooms were still sparsely furnished, but they often had a chest for valuables as well as a perch or rod for hanging clothes. Beds were still expensive. One like this would have cost almost three months' wages for a skilled craftsman. To try to understand Tudor attitudes to beds and sleep, I'm going to stay the night in this remote yeoman's farmhouse. And this is pretty smart, isn't it? How much of my how much of my wealth would have been tied up in this? Do you think? A third, maybe. A third of my household yeah. goods and yeah. the things. I this own. is something really special. First purchase upon marriage, do you think? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And if you're really lucky, you get left something like this. Privacy, in the modern sense, still didn't exist. Bedrooms were shared, not only by the married couple, but also by their children and even their servants. The only really private place for the couple was behind the bed curtains. So this is a truckle bed. A truckle bed. So that rolls out yeah. for children, servants. Yeah, anyone. Anyone who, who isn't as grand as the person who gets the bed, really. And this is a straw mattress. Yes. And then on top of that, we've got another mattress. That feels yeah. like feathers, uh -huh. in fact. Ooh, posh. Is that, that's quite classy. Yes, very footballer's wives, in the house, <laughs> if you ask me. Tighten those. Tudor people were terrified of the night and its dangers, from robbers to witches to evil spirits. It's um, not just an idea of making yourself comfortable, it's an idea of making yourself safe. <gasps> I'm defending the... myself against the night. Exactly. Okay. You don't know what spirits are lurking out there. 
the night air is considered dangerous and bad for your health. Yeah. If you sleep in the moonlight, you might go mad. That's where the word lunacy comes from. Oh, the light of yes. the lunar moon exactly, turns yes. you into a lunatic. Exactly. Lots of things to worry about. Basically. Right, I'm going to follow every single ritual I can get my hands exactly. on. Exactly. So where we're going to start is by mm -hmm. making sure you're nice and comfortable. And these bed strings have to be nice and tight so you can sleep tight. Do you know, I, I've always wondered why people say sleep tight and well, there you this go. is the answer, isn't it? And then what's the next bit of it? Don't let the bed don't bugs let, bite. Don't let the bugs bite. Right, well that's what we're going to do next. Check the bed for bugs. Because bed bugs are a big problem. You've just completely put me off the idea of sleeping in this bed. <laughs> I was quite looking forward to it until you said that. <laughs> well, that, we haven't got to the fleas yet. Oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. To keep the bed bugs at bay, they sprinkled wormwood, a herb used in traditional medicine, over the mattress, followed by chamomile to aid restful sleep. To drive out damp and warm the bed, they used rocks heated in the fire. There we go. How do you feel then about spending the night here? A bit worried about it. Well, as long as you take all the right precautions, you're OK. <laughs> Alison, you're I'm so like good. the person in the horror film who says that and then everything <laughs> yes. goes horribly yeah. wrong. <laughs> Nightfall was known as shutting in time. In a crowded yeoman's house like this, the master of the household would have checked and secured his property against human intruders. <laughs> But this was only part of the nightly ritual. They also had to protect themselves against unearthly intruders. I'm going to put my shoes upside down because Tudors genuinely believed that pixies and spirits might come and put them on in the night. I've got here my Tudor sleeping pill which is a little bag of aniseed, which apparently I can tie around my ears, like this. And the smell of the aniseed is supposed to send me to sleep and also stop me from having nightmares. I must admit, all of these rituals and preparations have made me slightly more nervous about the night ahead than I would have otherwise been. There's a theory that people had very different sleeping patterns to the eight hours we expect today. They would start with a first sleep of four hours and then naturally wake up. They were doing leisure things, things that they didn't have time to do in the, in the daylight, like meditating, praying, chatting, and obviously couples took the chance to have carnal knowledge of each other as well in the dead of the night. The only other thing that's awake around here at the moment is that owl, so I think I'll go back for my second sleep now. rather a disturbed night, I think it's fair to say. Because I live in the middle of the city, I was, I'm always longing for dark and 